America Looks Abroad. This is the 57th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association, a nonpartisan organization which offers accurate information on world affairs. Today's subject is War and Peace Prospects for 1941. The speaker is Mrs. Vera Michelis Dean, Director of the Research Department of the Foreign Policy Association. Mrs. Dean. Thank you. Here in the United States, where we seem far from the battlefields of Europe and Asia, the holiday season is darkened by anxiety about the coming year. How much darker are these days for the peoples of Europe, who in a short span of one year have lived through one of the most far-reaching upheavals known to history? Britain, locked in a grim struggle with Germany, is striving to prevent invasion from air and sea. At the same time, Britain is making every effort to maintain communications with overseas countries on which it depends in increasing measure for supplies of airplanes and armaments. Germany controls virtually the entire European continent. But as long as Britain resists, Europe remains isolated, cut off from overseas countries by the British blockade. Germany must therefore seek to deliver a mortal blow at the British Isles within the next few weeks or months before American aid to Britain has assumed substantial proportions. Italy, after suffering serious reverses in Albania and Africa, finds itself increasingly dependent on Germany. The Nazis may now stage a drive into the Balkans, both to relieve pressure on Italy and to divert British attention from the major theater of war in the West. Such a drive, in turn, may bring Germany into conflict with Russia, which until now has been hostile to both Britain and Germany, but is alarmed by the eastward expansion of the Nazis. Meanwhile, most Americans still hope that the United States can stay out of the wars that are ravaging other continents. Our people, however, are divided as to the best method of avoiding involvement in war. Some believe that our best insurance against war is to give Britain all the aid at our command so that the British can defeat Germany without military intervention on our part. Others fear that additional aid to Britain will precipitate an open clash between the United States and Germany. They fear that even should Britain win, the British would make a peace like that of Versailles, starting again the vicious circle of wars in Europe. They argue that war would destroy democratic institutions in this country, as well as Britain. Some of them consequently urge a negotiated peace between Britain and Germany before it is too late. In the midst of so much confusion and uncertainty, no one dare be so bold as to predict the outcome of the profound upheavals which are transforming the face of the world. One thing is clear. Whatever may be our views on the international situation, whether we are pacifists or isolationists or what are known as interventionists, we show by the very heat of our discussions that we are not indifferent to Europe's fate. Why is that? Why have we failed to achieve the kind of mental and emotional detachment that would make it possible for us to adopt a policy of isolation? Because we realize that for better or worse, the United States is part of that Western civilization that is being challenged by Nazism. Even if we should feel no concern for Europe's political and economic future, we are concerned with what is happening there in that deeper sense so well expressed by John Donne when he said many years ago, any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. That is why it is so important for us to understand Europe's experience. Some Americans believe that there is no need to worry about the outcome of the war in Europe because this country is not in danger of a military invasion. It is true that the United States is in no danger of immediate military invasion by Germany, even if Britain should be defeated tomorrow. But it would be a perilous illusion to believe that because this country is not threatened with invasion, it is therefore secure against the effects of the European conflict. As France and other continental countries discovered, disintegration from within can be far more dangerous than attack from without. Germany's so-called secret weapon is not a military weapon, it is the weapon of propaganda which divides a country from within, corrodes public opinion, sets parties and groups against each other, and finally achieves that internal breakdown of authority which paves the way for actual military occupation. This weapon of propaganda has been rightly described as secret because no country appears to be aware of it until it has been conquered by Germany. 
For what is the secret of Hitler's striking victories on the European continent? Some people believe his victories were due to Germany's extraordinary military machine. And it is true that Germany has an extraordinary military machine backed by an extraordinary economic machine. Others believe that Hitler's victories were due to the activities of fifth columns. And it is true that fifth columns aided the Nazis from within in every invaded country. But why has Britain succeeded so far, where France and others failed? Of course, the English Channel remains a strong defense against German invasion, even though its value has been diminished by the development of air and submarine warfare. But the secret of British resistance is neither superior armaments nor superior methods of dealing with fifth columns. The secret of British resistance is civilian courage. It is a courage springing from the belief of ordinary men and women, untrained for war and hating war, that their community, their institutions, their way of life are worth defending, and a voluntary determination of these men and women to make whatever sacrifice may prove necessary in terms of lives and material comforts and possessions. I stress the words civilian courage and voluntary determination to sacrifice because I believe that they provide a clue to the kind of a new order which the democratic peoples can offer as a valid alternative to the new order proposed by the Nazis. For without civilian courage, democratic society tends to disintegrate into anarchy. Out of the bitter experience of the past year, we are learning that democratic rights and freedoms are not automatically perpetuated. They must constantly be defended against encroachments by various groups and special interests. We are learning that democracy need not be synonymous with political agnosticism. On the contrary, democracy can thrive only if it is a living faith, which while tolerating other political faith, is ready to defend itself by force, if necessary. But while democracy cannot exist without civilian courage, neither can it exist without a spirit of sacrifice on the part of all groups of the population. As long as the peoples of Western countries fear to sacrifice lives and material possessions to defend themselves, the Nazis were bound to succeed, for the Nazis shrank from no sacrifices. Nazi propaganda could also argue that the democracies, while professing high ideals of international morality, were actually not ready either to fight in defense of their ideals or to fulfill them by surrendering some of their economic privileges. Again, out of the bitter experience of the past year, we are beginning to realize that peace, like freedom, cannot be automatically perpetuated. Today, the British are making sacrifices for war that they would never have dreamt of making for peace. Today, they are thinking in terms of international planning and international controls for their wartime needs, where yesterday, they, like ourselves, thought largely in terms of their own interests. It can only be hoped that some of the lessons people all over the world are now learning in time of war may be remembered when the time comes to build for peace. You might ask, well, under these circumstances, is there any basis for a negotiated peace? Is it not possible to shorten the war, to spare lives and economic resources, to prevent extension of the conflict before Britain and Germany have destroyed each other? This is obviously a tempting thought. If the struggle between Britain and Germany is to develop into a long-drawn stalemate, or if Germany is bound to win the final victory, would it not be better to end the war now and salvage what one can in Europe? As you know, a number of leading Americans, among them Senators Tidings and Wheeler, are urging our government to explore the possibilities of a negotiated peace, and Senator Wheeler has stated that in his opinion, a basis might be found for a just peace in Europe. Now, what are the obstacles to a negotiated peace? The first and most important is that the British do not trust Hitler. They feel that a peace negotiated with Hitler would be another and far more disastrous Munich, an uneasy truce which would give Germany leisure to prepare for a final blow against what is left of the Western world. You must also remember that in case such a truce were signed today, it would be practically impossible for the British to resume the conflict should Germany attack them again. Another important obstacle to negotiated settlement from the British point of view 
is that a peace negotiated today between Britain and Germany would be equivalent to a German victory. For at a peace conference held today, Germany, with its army and most of its industry intact, would insist on retaining its hegemony of Europe. It would demand a substantial share of Africa. It would insist on surrender of at least part of the British fleet. It would insist on free access by a German-controlled Europe to the foodstuffs and raw materials of Latin America. It would demand surrender of the French fleet and French colonies. The most the British could expect would be to keep the British Isles and to retain nominal control of those parts of the empire that lie outside Africa. Still another important obstacle to negotiated peace is that it would leave the conquered peoples of Europe to such fate as may be reserved for them by Germany. The British believe that to abandon these people now would not only be a repudiation of their pledge to liberate the peoples of Europe, but would not provide a basis for the just peace contemplated by men like Senator Wheeler. For these and many other reasons, the British are not ready to consider a negotiated peace, which they would regard as total defeat. Nor must we indulge in the belief that a negotiated peace would affect Britain alone. For if such a peace confirms German hegemony in Europe and a large part of Africa, the position of the United States is bound to be affected by this change in the balance of power. Germany already controls the principal shipbuilding facilities of Europe. It would then have direct access to the Atlantic, where, no longer confronted by the British fleet, it could challenge our sea power, while Japan challenges us in the Pacific. The United States might be in no immediate danger of invasion, but it would be confronted with uh, the most formidable industrial competitor it has ever faced and would be caught in a pincer-like movement between the combined threats of Germany and Japan. Under such circumstances, the United States would have no choice but to accept Axis-imposed isolation. And you must remember that isolation would not necessarily protect us against German penetration in the Western Hemisphere. What is the alternative to a negotiated peace of this character? The alternative, as the British see it, is complete and total defeat of Hitler, and the substitution in Germany of a regime possibly controlled by the army, which would be in a position to negotiate a peace Britain could trust. But you may ask, can the British achieve a complete and total defeat of Hitler? The answer, so far as can be determined, is that the British cannot achieve a decisive victory over Hitler unless they receive a much larger measure of aid from the United States, aid that might eventually involve military intervention by this country. Now, in the opinion of some Americans, involvement of this country in war is far more dangerous than the most disastrous negotiated peace. And we must, in all honesty to ourselves and to Europe, Realize that it will not be enough for the British, with our aid, to win the war. We would also have to help the British win the peace. Are we prepared to undertake the heavy responsibility, not only of giving further aid to Britain, even at the risk of war with Germany, but also, when war is over, of collaborating with Britain in the construction of a new order? In considering this question, we must realize that the United States is a great power and power cannot be divorced from responsibility. Even if all we do is urge Britain to accept a negotiated peace, would be, would be undertaking a grave responsibility, and to that extent would be intervening again in the European conflict. No course that lies before us is free from risk. This we must remember as we await the President's speech tonight and the decision of Congress in the new year. Mrs. Vera Michelis Dean, Director of the Research Department of the Foreign Policy Association, was today's speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. If you would like a free copy of this talk, address your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 22 East 38th Street, New York, or in care of the station to which you are listening. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world happenings. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.